Hello everyone and welcome to the History of Byzantium, episode 175, The Turks. I don't need to tell you that understanding the Turks is vital for understanding the history of Byzantium. And let's get to the headline right away. The most important thing you need to know about the Turks is that they were originally nomads from the steppe. Now for some of you, that will be blindingly obvious and need no further comment. For others, it might be less clear why this is a big deal. I've talked about how the nomad lifestyle worked before, as recently as episode 163, when we spoke about the Pechen eggs. That way of life was shared by all steppe tribes during our period, be they Huns, Avars, Bulgars, or indeed Turks. I won't go over the whole dynamic again, but let's just contrast the nomadic lifestyle to that of a farmer to make sure we're all on the same page. If you live in a farming community, then everything for you is static. The soil is the center of your life and you spend your time maneuvering around it, feeding it, extracting from it, protecting it. Because the soil is the fixed point in your life, you are going to be in favor of strong government. You want soldiers to give up their lives in order to protect your patch of ground. You will therefore acquiesce to the demands of government in exchange for protection. If, on the other hand, you live on the endless grasslands of the Eurasian steppe, your life is constantly on the move. Your animals are the most important thing to you. They perform the same function as the farmer's soil. They feed you, they produce products you can sell. They are your most valuable possession. You spend your life maneuvering around them, tending to them, watching them grow, selling them, killing them. It's an intimate relationship. The soil is important to you too, but your soil only grows different types of grass. Your animals hoover it up every minute of every hour of the day. Your relationship to it is therefore the opposite of the farmer. He protects one patch of ground for his whole life. You use it and move on. Your life is constant motion, always looking for more grass to feed your animals. You resent any imposition of government at all, because all governments divide land between people and deny you access to fresh pasture. These opposing worldviews created two very different societies. Take theft, for example. To a settled community, theft is a crime and evidence of bad behaviour. Since everyone has a home and their own possessions, to take something that doesn't belong to you is wrong. But in a nomad community, where people live in tents, property has a more communal feel. You couldn't really deny a friend access to your things. I'm sorry, you broke your saddle, but I'm not lending you my spare one. You have to share things, because you need everyone to continue performing their duties for the community to function. On a farm, you can close the door on your neighbor's struggles, but in a step tribe, the problem in the next tent is your problem too. Pushing this logic out into the wider community, when one group of settled people attack another, we call it war. But conflict between tribes of nomads was an accepted part of life. In the insecure, competitive, and borderless world of the steppe, tribes took what they needed to survive. Taking was part of life. Yes, neighbouring tribes formed bonds with one another, and confederations of tribes rose and fell. But ultimately, life was about securing your position. And when everyone takes from everyone else, is it really stealing anymore? 
It's a simplistic example, but hopefully it gives you a taste of the type of confrontation that might take place between a settled people and a nomadic one. Culturally, the two sides spoke very different languages. And thanks to a series of events in far-off places, the settled Byzantines and the nomadic Turks will soon come face to face with dramatic consequences. Today I'm going to tell you why the Turkic nomads came to the borders of the Roman Empire. But to understand it, you don't need to know names and dates and battles. You need to get your head around the priorities and behavior of the nomads. It's relatively easy for us to get to know the Byzantines by comparison, because although most of us don't live on farms anymore, our recent ancestors did, and we relate to the priorities of a settled civilization. To see through the eyes of the Turks will take a bit more effort. As you know, the grasslands of the Eurasian steppe run all the way from Hungary to northeast China. To the south of the steppe, there are many mountain ranges and giant bodies of water separating the nomads from the settled civilizations to the south. At several key points, though, this barrier is permeable, and it's at these spots that history has been radically changed time and again. One such entry point is the Hungarian plain. And as we've seen repeatedly in the shape of the Huns, Avars and Bulgars, steppe confederations that crossed the Danube could wreak havoc with Europe's farmers and townsfolk. Another highway between the two worlds can be found to the north of Iran. Modern Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan and southern Kazakhstan the river Jaxartes, as you'll read it, ran through the mountains there, offering a route into modern Afghanistan and Iran. We've been here before, actually. Way back in episode 17, I talked about the death of the Persian king of kings, Peroz, at the hands of the Hephthalites, the so-called White Huns. That was the last time that steppe riders threatened to march south and conquer the settled peoples of Iran. The Sassanids patched up their defences, and then the caliphate took over and held a firm line against the nomads for several centuries. By the time Basil II came of age, though, Iranian control over the frontier was slipping. The backdrop to this was the decline of the caliphate generally. We explored it back in episode 111. Baghdad had become very hard to govern, and the constituent parts of the empire had broken away. Egypt was controlled by the Fatimids, Syria divided between many statelets, and Iran was run by the Buyid dynasty. Common to this whole area were two problems. Legitimacy, which was tricky given the religious and ethnic divisions of many places, and control of the armies. As you may remember, the caliphate had turned to slave soldiers, whose loyalty was theoretically easier to guarantee. And where did the majority of their slaves come from? The steppes, of course. Generations of Turkic boys had been raised as soldiers and now dominated the military across the whole region. Inevitably, some came to govern in their own right or held their rulers hostage when events didn't go their way. Problems like these found their way north of Iran, too. The border with the steppe world was held during this time by the Samanids. And while Basil II was fighting his civil wars, similar trouble was brewing among the notables of this Iranian regime. Senior men of the area began hiring nomads to fight their domestic rivals. And by the turn of the millennium, the Samanid dynasty had fallen, and with them went the barrier keeping the steppe tribes out. The nomads living along the Jaxartes River had undergone a similar process to the German tribes who brought down the Western Roman Empire. They had established a trading relationship with the settled peoples, they'd occasionally raided, they had been hired as mercenaries, 
and they had begun to adopt the religion of their southern neighbours. You'll recall that the Goths and Vandals had already become Christians before they migrated into the empire. This conversion gave them a sheen of respectability. They seemed less barbaric and could be reasoned with. So here, the Seljuks and dozens of other tribes had become Muslims, freeing them to take a more active role in the politics of the former caliphate. So, while Basil II was grinding down Bulgaria, the eastern part of the caliphate was slowly taken over by steppe tribes. Initially, they fought for local Iranian rulers as men attempted to fill the vacuum left by the collapse of the Samanids. But when the nomads realized that they were now the dominant military force in the region, they dispensed with their overlords and began fighting one another for control. In this chaotic landscape, the Seljuk dynasty grew and flourished. As you can imagine, this was a time of shifting alliances and many battles, which we don't need to be concerned with. But by 1040, so 15 years after Basil II's death, the Seljuks had defeated their major rivals and taken control of eastern Iran. There are stories to read about the Seljuks, about their founder Seljuk, son of Dukak, and how he'd converted to Islam and how his sons built their confederation. But these stories were written after the Seljuks had become masters of Baghdad. And as we talked about during the Origins of Islam episode, tribal histories are open to major distortions based on the needs of the present, particularly when justifying the rise of a dynasty in religious terms. The details, therefore, aren't that vital. The reality is that the Seljuks were one of many steppe tribes who were welcomed into a world without reliable standing armies. No one had the amazing skill they did with bow and horse, and they therefore seized power and used it to bring other tribes under their sway and eventually annexed the settled civilization that had welcomed them in in the first place. The major political developments of the Seljuk rise will come up in the narrative. They didn't emerge as the dominant military force in Iran until 1040, and won't reach Baghdad until 1055, so we have time to get to know them later. But let's go back to 1025, where our story is paused, because already by then, Turkic nomads had reached the borders of Armenia. As best we can tell, one group raided the kingdom of Vaspurakan around 1016 or 17, an attack which helped convince the king to offer Basil his realm in exchange for lands in Cappadocia. Now, all the action I've mentioned so far has taken place in eastern Iran and its surroundings, so you might be wondering why some nomads are over 1,500 miles away in Armenia. Understanding this is key to all that comes next involving Byzantium. When the Samanids fell, the Turkic tribes that moved south did not come just as mercenary troops. They migrated en masse with their families and their herds. The grasslands were relentlessly competitive, and the tribes had entered the Islamic world looking for a better life. For some, this might mean accepting settlement and military service in exchange for pay, but others just kept moving. They turfed peasants off the land and began grazing their animals. If money was offered to fight, they might take it, but in the meantime, they had to continue living their life. I've put up a map of the topography of Europe and the Middle East, which is key to understanding this movement. You see, the center of Iran is pretty uninhabitable. The dasht e kavir is a great salt desert in the middle of the Iranian plateau. And steppe tribes entering Iran would have encountered it fairly swiftly. To the east, there were places to go, but this was where many tribes were already active in local politics. So for those looking to avoid congestion, west was the way to go. 
with the Caspian Sea on one side and the desert on the other, the nomads kept moving until they reached Azerbaijan. Here, to their delight, they found acres of pasturage. The Caucasus actually possesses several large pockets of steppe-like grassland in between the mountain peaks. These Turkic nomads had found a new home, an area with little competition from the locals, who had no chance against the composite bow, and a wide area to move through, summer pasture in the highlands and winter refuge in the lowlands. These pockets of suitable terrain passed through Muslim lands into Armenian and Georgian territory and then ran on to the Anatolian plateau. That plateau had formed such an effective barrier against the Arabs, but here it was exactly what the steppe riders were looking for. It would be some time before the potential of Roman territory was fully realized, but by 1025 a significant number of tribes had already migrated west to the borders of Armenia and found a new home there that suited their lifestyle. Geography dictated this development. You might think, well, the caliphate is a big place, go somewhere else. But where else was there free grassland within the Islamic world? The further south you go, the more you hit the urban areas of Iran, where there were cities and armies that could offer resistance, and of course a very different climate. The Caucasus were much more familiar. They are, after all, only a hundred miles south of regular steppe grassland. Yes, there were mountains in the way, but the nomads were used to this terrain, they were used to the extreme temperatures that came with this environment. And because of the political fragmentation of the area, military resistance was weak. Despite their profession of Islam, the nomads terrorized the Azerbaijani Muslims as much as the Caucasian Christians. It wasn't personal. It was just that they wanted unhindered access to the grass. That was their way of life. So, this is how things stood as our narrative resumes. And when it does, the nomads will begin to explore the Armenian mountains. They didn't care who ruled here or what empire the land belonged to, nor did they particularly care who was in charge back in Baghdad or beyond. What they wanted was to secure access to pasture, and if they could find settlements to raid to enrich themselves, all the better. Eventually, the Seljuk dynasty will take control of Iraq, Syria, Iran, and Arabia, bringing a large chunk of the caliphate back under one authority. But they will never fully tame the nomads who came in their wake. The peoples now living in Azerbaijan will go on practicing their lifestyle how they wanted to for the next century and beyond, regardless of what those living in Constantinople or Baghdad had to say about it. This will create a new and complex challenge for Byzantium. As we've discussed during these end-of-the-century episodes, the Romans liked to fight enemies who were like them, who had a patch of ground they wanted to defend. People with a patch to protect will negotiate, they will respect agreements, they will stand still as your cataphracts charge towards them. Nomads are very different. With no patch to defend, they cannot be reasoned with, they cannot be surrounded, they cannot be threatened in the same way. Nor, despite those raids on Vaspurakan, did the Romans see this coming. Basil's annexation of Armenia was light and expedient. The idea was to shut down meddling mountain lords and bring them into the system of honours that made men bow before the emperor. No attack had come from this direction in a century, and no hostile steppe riders had been seen in the Caucasus since the days of Attila himself. The clash between men of grass and men of soil will not be pretty, but it will be very, very interesting. Next time, I sit down with Peter Adamson to talk about one of our best sources for the 11th century, 
Michael Selos. And yes, that is History Podcasting Royalties' Peter Adamson from the history of philosophy without any gaps.